Good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grodi, and I'm joined with my son, John Mark. Hello, John Mark. Dan, be back. Just making a connection there to make sure we're we're connecting over this internet uh, medium. We're connected, yeah. Loud and clear, yeah. Sounds cool. All right, great. Well, thank you all for joining us on this on this episode of Deep in Scripture. I, I hope whatever wherever you are and wherever whatever you're doing and that you're safe and sound and faithful and uh, that you're experiencing the blessings of the Lord. We don't know who's listening or even when, but um, I do believe that this, the scriptures that we're going to look at today touch on our lives because of the times that we live. And I, I think it's important to recognize that this is the time that we live. And so we can't avoid that when we're ever we're looking at scripture. That's off. That's the context. There's the context that which the scriptures were written, and then there's the context in which they're being read. And I think both are are very important. But we're going to take a little bit different direction for the next couple of weeks. Um, Probably more than a couple. Yeah, I, I'm, I think you're right, John Mark. This might be longer. Um, you know, we've done deep in scripture for many years, and off and on we've done a, a, a slant of a program which we called Deep in Christ. That was, I think that was one of the early names of a program I did when I was doing radio for EWTN. And then, John Mark, you've done it off and on. For yeah, last and that years. still may be to come down the road uh, as a separate project, but for now. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's what we're aiming for. But we thought that maybe for now we'll do a kind of a Deep in Scripture slash Deep in Christ series and uh, Jamar, how would you describe the difference in maybe our uh, our focus on a deep in Christ program versus what I've always done in the deep in Scripture program? Right. Well, my understanding of it is that uh, deep in Scripture, we're usually we're starting with the Scripture and then examining it prayerfully, and then working our way outward to what is this speaking to us into in the context with which we're reading it. You know, the the slight different. Uh, approach might be for a, a deep in crisis where we're looking at um, the context of the Christian life, living out the gospel. We're, we're looking at topics or aspects of that challenges, opportunities, and then we're digging into those and then recognizing, okay, what, what are the scriptures that uh, give insight to this? But also what, what are the insights from tradition, from the catechism, from the lives of the saints, the great spiritual writers. And so in this case, yeah, you found a really uh, amazing text from Cyprian that gives a lot of really interesting topics, ideas that you're going to go over, and what makes it still deep in scripture uh, is that we're going to we're going to look back at the scriptural texts that support those and that break open the different topics for us to understand how better to live the Christian life. Another reason, along with what you said, John Mark, that I have always sought that a a focus on deep in Christ was important for us. You know, if you will, our, one of our logos that we have is deep in scripture, deep in history, deep in Christ. Uh, that, that's mm -hmm. how you describe our work, our understanding of yeah. our work, deep in scripture, deep in history, deep in Christ. And so we have a deep in scripture right. program, deep in history. And then, of course, our goal was to have deep in Christ program. And, and the reason for that emphasis, for those of you that know what we do in the Coming Home Network, some people think we're only about making people Catholic. And so everything we do is about that. Well, that isn't true. Mm. That even, isn't even the main goal of our work. Mm. The main goal of our work is to help people be deep in Christ. That's the main goal of our work. Yeah. And we believe that Christ gave us a church, and so if you want to be deep in Christ, that's through the church. But we also recognize an awful lot of people that are separated from the church and are helping discern what, how God's calling them to be deep in Christ. Right. So our only goal is that they just drop everything and become Catholic. If that's what God wants them to do, then praise God. But that may not be at this moment what God's calling yeah. them to do. God might be saying, come back to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's such an interesting situation we find ourselves in relation to this work because, you know, as you often point out, you know, we're mo we, many in our network, our former evangelical Protestants, um, but they didn't leave the church. We didn't leave the church. You know, we right. were born into Presbyterianism or Methodism or Lutheranism, you know, yeah. or for, for some of some of us and them, 
Um, we did leave the church, but it was because people grew up as Catholics and it just didn't click for whatever reason. But the point is people who feel this call to come back uh, uh, to the fullness, to be reconciled with Catholicism, they're coming because they are deep in Christ and they want to go deeper. They, they, they're coming because they love Christ. And in the working out of, the, of that deepening of that relationship, the, the step that's come up next is now I want to give you more. Uh, in my in my Catholic Church, and so if that's where the step that people are on, we're you know praise God, we're here to help. If we work with a person, we give them answers, and for whatever reason they're not quite there yet, we're not discouraged, and we're not upset. We still praise God that they are discerning and they're prayerful, and they're not giving up their relationship with God. We praise God for that. Uh, a scripture that confronts me and challenges me is actually from an Old Testament prophet by the name of Jeremiah, who tradition believes that he wrote the books First and Second Kings, which is all about the division of the Davidic kingdom into a northern and a southern kingdom, where you have um, uh, the, you know, the, the Judah and Benjamin are separated now from the other ten tribes. Well, Jeremiah writes his prophecy during the reign of King Josiah, which is one of the last kings of, of Judah before they're taken into exile. So here's the point. Jeremiah is writing as a prophet during the time of the division of Israel. And he's God speaking through him to Israel, the northern kingdom, and to Judah and Jerusalem, the southern kingdom. What does God say through Jeremiah to them? They're just about ready to be carried away into Babylon and into exile. But what is God telling them? He's saying, come back to me. His main emphasis isn't, you guys are divided. You need to, all you Israelites need to get, leave where you are and go back to Judah. That wasn't his point at that time. It was, yeah. come back to me, mm -hmm. to God. Yeah. And that's what I believe a Deep in Christ program is about, coming back to Christ. Yeah, you, you, we were talking about this yesterday, and it reminded me of that old analogy of marriage, you know, as a, as a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. You know, whenever there's division, whether it's in a marriage or there's a, a great divorce in the church, you know, we have the divisions. Or if, it, if it's scandals in the church, things are going on. We have a desire to fix those, and rightly so. But that desire has to be rooted in and to begin always with my conversion, my returning to God wherever I am. You know, it's easy to get to get uh, really self-reliant and want to go out there and fix the things, but to, to kind of rush out ahead of God, to leave behind his peace, to rely on my own strength rather than his. And that's where we just get more turmoil and more scandal. We have to start with, Lord, I want to be part of the solution here, but I'm availed to your guidance in that. You know, create in me a clean heart, O oh God you know, and then show me the way that I can contribute. Right. Exactly, John Mark. As, as husbands and fathers, wives, mothers, um, uh, men and women, witnesses to Christ in our culture, um, we want them to see our Catholicism, but they better see Jesus. They better see Jesus. Because if they don't see Jesus in us, our Catholicism means nothing. If anything, it's it's a negative. Yeah. If it's not about Christ, so that's what we want to focus. And this uh, writing from Cyprian happens to be uh, the the readings from the Office of Readings for mm. yesterday. Yeah. And right now, during this eleventh week of ordinary time, the the second reading in the Office of Readings is from Cyprian's um, treatise on the Lord's Prayer. And it's it ought to be read in entirety. In fact, yeah. today's, today's section, uh, we're recording this on a Thursday, and so today's reading is the next part in the Lord's, which is about give us this day our daily bread. And so you, you read Cyprian's very strong endorsement of the Eucharist the necessity of receiving the Eucharist, our daily bread. And so that ought to be read. But we're not going to focus on that section. We're going to focus on the section right before that, which is on 
on uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the section of the Lord's Prayer that we're going to focus on. Before we jump in, though, I just want to also say that knowing a little bit about Cyprian is important. The author of this. And I, as I said earlier, I think on uh, on the program or whether you, John Mark, were talking about that, um, whenever we read scripture, even when we read a a writing from the early church fathers, we again have that juxtaposition of the context of the writing itself, and how does it affect us in our context. And so to understand really the background of what's going on in the life of Cyprian when he's writing this treatise so that we can apply his words even more deeply to our, really, it's really fascinating. Um, Cyprian lived in the first half of the third century. So he lived between about 200 and 260 or so. That's when he lived. We don't really know when he was born. Uh, there's an assumption that he was already a well-known person, very wealthy, very influential when he was baptized in maybe middle age. And he was declared a bishop before he was a priest. So he's one of those guys that, you know, he was hardly, he'd just been baptized. And then he's acclaimed a bishop of Carthage. Hmm. And then he goes through all the hoops and becomes a priest and, and full, you know, fully ordained a bishop. Um, Carthage, at one time in the history of, of the ages before Christ, was the most powerful city in the Mediterranean and one of the main rivals of Rome. Mm -hmm. If you want to picture where it's at, if you look at, if you envision the Mediterranean and there's Italy coming down like a boot, mm -hmm. the boot, which points kind of southwest and goes to the island of, what was that, uh, uh, Sicily. I think that's the island right off the boot. Sounds right. But if you take a trajectory from the boot, like it's kicking a ball across the Mediterranean to the coast, directly the coast of Africa is Carthage. Mm -hmm. They're right there. Mm -hmm. So the reason I bring this up is that we know in the history of Cyprian that he was a bishop of Carthage, and there were often struggles between authority between the bishop of Carthage and the bishop of Rome. It wasn't always uh, a smooth sailing uh, ship here. Mm -hmm. And one of his most famous letters is on unity. It's also available. If you go to newadvent.com, you click on the fathers, you find Cyprian, you click, there's all the, there's all these letters we're talking about. And on unity is one of his most important letters because there was great division at the time because in those periods there was persecution and there was yeah. bad persecution. And one of the issues was, do I, do I take a stand for my faith to get martyred or not? And that was a huge problem in that time. A lot of people didn't. They lapsed. Their question was, well, what about the people that didn't, the, the people that floundered, the people that didn't stand for their faith in the midst of all the struggles? They gave in to the pressures of culture. They, they didn't take a stand for their faith. And it wasn't just that they, they avoided dying. Sometimes that wasn't it. It was other uncomfortableness, sometimes not a, a big deal, but will, would they hold true? And would they, some, there were some that were able to buy, uh, pay someone to write them a document that, that kind of said they were, they had given in so mm -hmm. that they could avoid persecution. And this led to a big problem in the church. And do we allow a person that didn't, um, uh, go through martyrdom back into the church. If they recanted, you know, yeah. Th this was the time. This was a real time. It was a time struggling about, you know, forgiveness of sins and what sins can be forgiven and um, what about confession and who do you go? I mean, it was a, a time. This was 
200 years after Christ, but it was still about, uh, you know, another 50, 60 years before Constantine frees the church. It's still another 75 years before the Council of Nicaea, when all this stuff is more defined. It's still 150 years before Augustine, before Jerome. I mean, so we're in a period that's long before a lot of stuff we take for granted hasn't been defined yet. Right. And so Cyprian's writing during this time. And he himself will be martyred within five years, let's say, of the writing of this letter. So the, the, the understanding of, of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is in the midst of a time of tremendous turmoil. Yeah. As bad as we think it is when we watch the evening news, folks, it was worse during the time of Cyprian. All right. Mm. So any comments on that, John Mark, before we move on to the text? I don't think so. No, let's let's dive in, I think. Okay. All right. So we're not going to cover the whole section. And if you want to and find it, if you look at the Office of Readings, 11th week of Ordinary Time on Wednesday, you'll see the entire text that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the first paragraph today and just reflect on the things that Cyprian says and, and do we understand them? Do we believe them? And uh, John Mark, why don't you go ahead and read that just that first paragraph? Sounds good. He writes, After this we add, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray not that God should do his will, but that we may carry out his will. How could anyone prevent the Lord from doing what he wills? But in our prayer we ask that God's will be done in us because the devil throws up obstacles to prevent our mind and our conduct from obeying God in all things. So if his will is to be done in us, we have need of his will, that is, his help and protection. Thank you, John Mark. There's, there is so much in this paragraph historically of what's going on at the time when this was written philosophically, theologically, doctrinally. There's battles between people that will be called heretics because they don't quite, you know, stick to the, the line of orthodoxy about the example, how could anyone prevent the Lord from doing what he wills? Now, John Mark, from a, you're, you're a philosopher, a student, <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, Think, just talk about that sentence alone. How could anyone prevent the Lord from doing what he wills? Yeah. Yeah, he's digging into a classic philosophical and theological uh, mystery, you know, that, you know, the, the, the greatest trouble comes when we try to simplify that mi mystery into one direction or the other. It's this mystery of God's grace interplaying with our, our free will or God's being all knowing God's foreknowledge and our ability to choose, you know, God has a perfect will. God is all good, all knowing and all powerful. So his will will be done. Well, how does that work with our free will, our ability to make choices? The, ultimately, while philosophers and theologians can, can tiptoe through that and, and try to give us some little bit of clarity and decision, ultimately the reality is there's still always going to be a mystery there. We know it does work. We don't know how, because in scripture, all throughout scripture, all throughout a tradition, we're, we're to hold up these two realities. God is God. He's all knowing, all good, all powerful. His will will be done. But somehow that interacts with his gift of free choice to me. I have, I have will. I can cooperate with him. Um, how that works, we don't know. But the point is, is it does. That I, I need to pray for his will to be done, but I also have to participate in it. And I need his help to do it. It's that interplay of... of grace and free will that we we can't exhaust and figure out, but we, we can live out and we must. This sentence, how could anyone prevent the Lord from doing what he wills? We, we could fill pages and pages of scriptures that deal with this text. It really is amazing. The whole book of Job. Right. Were you there when I made this? You yeah. know? Can, can you 
put put a bit or in the mouth of the Iathon. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, you know. In other words, it, in awe mm-hmm. of the will of God is a is an awesome mystery. And part mm-hmm. of the problems with the early church was people trying to define it. And it, it, it just led to so many problems. If they'd have followed the advice of St. Paul as well as St. Irenaeus, they said, don't get caught up in all that stuff. There's a yeah. great mystery here. But the one thing you can know is that there's nothing anybody can do mm-hmm. to prevent God from doing what he wills. Mm-hmm. So with that statement, is that a statement that gives us hope? or terror. And that depends on how you understand God. And that in itself is a profound religious foundation of our Christian, Judeo-Christian faith that sets us apart from other religions. Is if, if, if there's nothing we can do to prevent the Lord from doing what he wills, then what kind of a Lord do we have? so that we understand what it is he wills. Yeah. And when we, when we come up with words to define our Lord, how would we define him? Merciful, steadfast in love, always forgiving. Yeah. In the Psalms, I, I, I wish I could grab it right now, but David at one point says he does, he's not so interested in our sins, but our heart. Yeah. He's a father. That's the image. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, how could anyone prevent the Lord from doing what he wills? The foundation of that is a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's why we want his will to be done, because we know it is good. Mm-hmm. There are other faiths, i got to be careful, but I think more of the Muslim faith has a different image of God. And the will of God might not be something you always want done. It might be very retribution. What's the word? Tributive. Tributive, yeah. Yeah. You know, vengeful. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was the struggle with Job. Mm -hmm. I mean, to simplify it, I've been been a good guy. What's with all this stuff? How do I explain that? You know, in, in... and it's the importance of of the of our divine. Like, there's a lot that we can come to know about God, what God is, what, what God is, what God isn't. Mostly, what He isn't um, through natural reason, but it's through divine revelation. It's through Christ, where it's through the Scriptures that we have some of these essential, divinely revealed truths about who God is that we have to hold with us, especially when life makes us wonder and question. Like when, like Job, we experience the bewildering ups and downs of life, the question is, do we hold on to the divinely revealed truth that God is love, that he is a father, that despite what is happening right now, I know that God's will will be done. And that, as it says in Romans 8, 28, you know, uh, all things work together together for good for those who love God. You know, do I believe that? Do I believe that in the good times? Do I believe that in in the, in the rough times? Do I hold on to that? All th- that's it. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Yeah. And another verse from Romans, while we were yet sinners, yeah. he died for us. Mm-hmm. While we were yet sinners. And so we, we want God's will to be done. And again, you know, we, we could talk about this for a long, long, long time. But this brings us back to why Christ gave us a church, because as he's going to say here, there are lots of voices that are going to un- try to undercut our, our trust in God, mm-hmm. in his will. And so we, we need a voice that we can trust so mm-hmm. that we have the right understanding of God, the Father, Christ our Lord, his Son, the Holy Spirit, three gods in one, 
three persons in one God. I know. I, I said it yeah. that way purposefully. You know what God. I'm saying? <laughs> I you know, see. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, they're three gods, but how do we fit them together? We need a voice we can trust. Yeah, that makes those distinctions and says, okay, what what does God mean? What does person mean? Yeah, that that that's when those distinctions become really important, and we have a church that can define those things for us. When Cyprian was writing, it hadn't been defined dogma yet. Right. It's right. not that they didn't believe in the Trinity, but they weren't using the word yet. Right. Right. Or it wasn't defined in the church quite yet. So Mm -hmm. we are grateful that God's will was done in the church to help us know what is true. Mm -hmm. If you lose that, it all unravels. And you can end up with an image in your mind of of a God that's vengeful, that is always waiting to trip you up. Mm -hmm. You know, he's looking for ways to laugh at you. That's not our God. That's why Jesus began this prayer with what? Our Father, our Father, a community, Mm -hmm. our Father. And so uh, we pray not that God should do his will, but that we may carry out his will. How could anyone prevent the Lord from doing what he wills? And, And so we say, praise God. We want that to happen. We look in the craziness of what's going on. Cyprian's writing, you know, people are being martyred all around him and people are giving up their faith all around him. He himself mm-hmm. will die within five years, but we want your will to be done. That's why a person would allow himself to be drawn before, an, uh, you know, the local procreator, um, uh, not procreator, um, Procurator? Procurator. Is that what it is? <laughs> it's something like that. Now I can't think of it because I've said it wrong. But anyway, you know, and, and, and be told you sacrifice to the gods, you yeah. burn the books, the, the Christian books, you give us the, the, and the person would say, no, I will stand. I will trust. Why? Because I can trust God's will. Mm-hmm. I know that this is what's best for me. And then he goes on, but in our prayer, we ask that God's will be done in us because the devil throws up obstacles to prevent our mind and our conduct from obeying God in all things. So we're drawn to this, you know, not just that we trust that God's will will be done on earth mm-hmm. as it is in heaven, but Cyprian says we ask that God's will be done. In us. Yeah. And that in itself gets very personal. Mm-hmm. In us. Yeah. In us. And there we have the spiritual battle. And, and Cyprian, right there, the world, the mm-hmm. flesh, and the devil are all in that sentence. Yeah. The devil throws up obstacles to prevent our mind and our conduct from obeying God in all things. I like the way he puts it there. Mm-hmm. There's a very important theological nuance. He doesn't say, but the devil prevents our mind and our conduct from obeying God in all things. He doesn't say that. Right. What does he say? There was up obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. He can't control us. He can't force us to do anything, but he can uh, tempt us. He can distract us. He can flood the market, as you like to say, you know, with information, with data, with stimuli. Uh, but ultimately, it still comes down to what I do in my will, my heart of hearts, where I do, where I move. Yeah, yeah. One of the scriptures that came to mind um, as we were preparing for this is is First Peter five, um, in which Peter says, "Cast all your anxieties on Him, for He cares about you." And let me just stop there. Do you understand? That the reason Peter can say that is because they have an understanding of God as one they can trust, yeah. as one whose will they can trust. You know, I think John Mark about, I don't know why this came to my mind, but out at the farm, right, I got all these cats, you know, and I've got more cats than anything else, and now I got a bunch of kittens. And I, I'm trying to get them to trust me, mm-hmm. and they're kind of iffy about it. You know, I can pick them up, and but they're not quite there. They kind of keep just enough away from me. Is he going to pet me or eat me? I'm just not sure quite yet. You know? 
He pet me last time, but he might be hungry this time. I don't know. You know, the adult cats, some of them learn to trust. Some of them stay away. They never get a chance to learn that we're, excuse me, guys, we're here to help you. We're here to love you. We're here to feed you. We're here to take care of you. Can't we communicate with you? And some of them never give us a chance because they have such an image of us in their mind that they'll never give us a chance. And so they stay away. They stay away. Yeah. They stay away. Yeah. Yeah, It's actually interesting to compare, yeah, to to think about the image of an animal or, you know, a a non-rational animal and a rational animal. You know, we like the cats. We have impulses and passions and movements, you know, uh, emotions, uh, reactions to stimuli. The difference is that we have an eye that is very distinct from what the animal has that can be self-reflective about those experiences. I'm experiencing anxiety and fear, you know, and, and I'm, I'm frightened or I'm worried, but I can reflect on that and I can make a decision of how to respond to it. You know, I can give into that and run away and give up and blow this all off and say, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm done with this craziness. Or we can, as it says, cast all our anxieties on him. Say, Lord, I don't know why this is happening and I've done what I can do and it doesn't seem to be enough. Here are my anxieties. Here are my fears. And the, the Psalms, we were just talking about the Psalms earlier before the program. You give us this image that that's the kind of God we have. We can, you know, we don't, I can't remember who pointed this out once uh, in a talk or, or a homily, but that sometimes we we make the mistake of coming to God and telling him, oh, I think it was uh, Bishop Barron on one of his uh, podcasts, perhaps. You know, we make the mistake sometimes of coming to God and telling him what we think he wants to hear, you know, like a bunch of pious language, you know, but we keep our hearts to ourselves. He wants our hearts. You know, we need to be vulnerable with the Lord. Lord, I'm hurting. I'm anxious. I don't understand. Like we need to bring that to God and ask him to, to work on our hearts. It's because we have this image of God that's hopefully we've picked up along the years through the teaching of the church in scripture and tradition so that the image we have in our mind of God is one in which we can go to him without fear. We can go to him without fear because we know even when we've failed, that's why our Lord gives us the the parable of the prodigal son, even when we failed, that when we come home, he's there ready to receive us. So because of that, we can cast, again, back to 1 Peter, we can cast all our anxieties on him for he cares about you. And then he goes on, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, and strengthen you, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I mean, it's almost as if St. Cyprian had just read that yeah. in his morning devotions. Mm-hmm. And that was in his mind as he's reflecting on, may the will of God be done in our lives. Because he says, yeah, in the midst of all that struggle they're going through, in the persecution, and with the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil's there to put up obstacles. But as you emphasize, John Mark, but he can't do it. He can put up obstacles. But the devil cannot. Yeah. As Paul says in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God except ourselves. Yeah. Right. But, yeah, there's such, a, there's such an interesting, again, mi- mystery. There's a sort of mysteries within mysteries here because... Um, there are different senses of God's will. Like it, it, God has a perfect will and God has a desire in a sense for me to be a saint, but God also has, he gives me free choice and he allows me to fail. He allows me to sin if that's my choice. And somehow in the mystery of things, that is part of God's will in the sense of allowing that to happen because he can also bring greater good out of that if in my repentance. And so in the mystery of things, the whole, all the things of the world combined together, you know, his desire is everything we see around us is somehow mysteriously part of his will. But then every choice I make, again, I'm either, his will is going to be done. It's the question of whether it's going to be done in and through me or in spite of me. That's maybe one way we would think about it. Yeah. And even that's true for the devil too. 
you know, it's part of, mysteriously, it's part of his, we might say, permissive will. The devil is allowed, our adversary is allowed to tempt us, to try to frighten us, to put up obstacles. But even there, he allows that to happen because he can bring greater good out of that if we cast our cares on him and rely on him. Uh, right now in the morning, I'm reading a book that will soon be published mm. by Dr. Peter Kreeft, Kreft, I'm not sure the best way to say it, um, on the Psalms. It will come out by Ignatius Press, but it's not out there yet. And he, I just remember something that related to what you were saying, John Mark, because mm. I wish I had it in front of me to quote, but Peter Kreft talks about the will of God being done and that, and that sometimes in his will he allows what seems like great evil. But the one thing that Dr. Kreft points out is that unless the ultimate goal of this is good, he won't allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. Unless our loving Father's ultimate reason for this thing happening is good, yeah. he won't allow it to happen. Right. He's not a, a God that just whatever. Yeah. He has an ult his will is the ultimate, yeah. and that's the, again, from our Catholic Christian perspective, that's our understanding of God, that his ultimate mm -hmm. purpose is good. In mm -hmm. Romans 8, it says, we are children of God, we can call him Abba, provided we suffer with him. Mm -hmm. That's a necessary part, because we understand that on the other side of that suffering mm -hmm. is good. Yeah. And there's nothing... Again, with this interplay, God is all good and all knowing and all powerful. So his plan is perfect. The question is whether I cooperate with, with it, whether I enter into it and let it be done through me or it happens in spite of me. The thing is, there's nothing we can do that from all eternity, God didn't know we were going to do. Yeah. That isn't mysteriously part of his plan. And so the, the, sometimes we can look ahead, you know, when our discernment, we wake up in the morning, we look ahead and it seems like there's a dizzying array of decisions. Oh, I got all the things I could possibly do. God's what's your will for my life. But in some sense, ultimately there's only two paths in front of us. I'm either trying sincerely in my ignorance, in my weakness, trying to cooperate with God's will or for whatever reason I'm not either through fear or through obstinance or through any other reason. I'm just, I'm either withholding, I'm holding back from God. Or, or I'm trying to cooperate. Either I'm saying yes or I'm saying no. And the thing is, if I'm saying yes, even though I'm weak, even though I'm ignorant, even though I, you know, the, the point is, God saw that from all eternity. And in that next step, we find that he's already there. He's provided the grace. He's provided the way out. He's provided the next step. You know, we can step forward with the, in faith and hope and love. We can step forward with a certain confidence as Christians that the, the Lord is with me. This is in his plan. I don't know where this is going, but I know he's going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, people look at the world today and, you know, the craziness that's happening in our culture and even in the confusion in our own church, the confusion amongst Christians, the confusion in politics, the, mm -hmm. and the, the worldwide pandemic and all the stuff that's happening. And you, you kind of you might wonder, it's kind of like, that James passage, you know, mm -hmm. delight in this, you know, all joy. Well, it counted all joy when you face all this stuff. And it's like, what mm -hmm. are you talking about? Well, the bottom line it seems to me is there are three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. And we believe through the teaching of the church that these aren't virtues that, that, that we initiate right. through our effort, though the point is, I, don't, I think it's important that we not get too philosophical because we still are called willfully to have faith and willfully to have hope and willfully to yeah. love. We just know that came from grace. But, yeah. the, 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 but the virtue that we're talking about here mm -hmm. is not so much the virtue of faith, though we believe there's a God that loves us, mm -hmm. and it's not so much a virtue of charity because that's our action to, uh, to, to reach out in faith to, to God and others. But we're talking about the virtue of hope, of not giving up in the midst yeah. of all this 
stuff because we have a God who loves us, whose will will be done, period. Yeah. yeah. We just want it to be done in us. Right. And that's what we're praying for in the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, yeah. Our faith, our faith in our God, the kind of God we believe in, you know, God who is a father, who is love, is our faith in the present in that God that allows us to hold on to this hope that in the end, in the big scheme of things, from his perspective, his will will be done and it will be good, you know, and I want to be part of that. And for that to happen, Mm -hmm. we know his will will be done. Mm -hmm. We can't stop that. And and we're happy for that because Mm -hmm. of the kind of God we have faith in. Praise God. And in the midst of the, the we have a, a battle going on because the world, the flesh, and the devil want to put up obstacles to prevent his will being done in us. Right. All right. So to be able to do that, mm. we need help. And so Cyprian goes on, so if his will is to be done in us, we have need of his will, that is, his help and protection. Mm -hmm. We need him Mm -hmm. to do his will. And again, that draws me back to some other scriptures that we put down here to consider, James 4, 6 Mm -hmm. through 10. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Mm. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you men of double mind. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to death. Dejection, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Yeah. It's a dance. (laughs) (laughs) We're dancing with God. You know, it's always the um, pray as if it all, it's all up to God. Work as if, as it is, he's calling you to conversion, calling you to work. You know? Yeah, this Mm -hmm. this mystery Mm -hmm. of humility. Yeah. He gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud. He gives grace. And there, there James is quoting mm-hmm. uh, uh, an Old Testament text, I think. Mm-hmm. It's funny because James quoted some things outside the Bible too, so, but I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure he's either quoting Christ or, or maybe a tradition there. But God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. That's what humility is. Mm-hmm. Submit yourself, therefore, to this God you can trust, whose will you can trust, whose will you want to be done, not mm-hmm. only in the world, but in your own life. So allow it to happen. That's what submitting is done. The, de- the, re- the devil, just resist him. He'll flee. Mm-hmm. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you men of double mind. You know where that comes from? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you men of double mind. That's the Psalms. In other words, Psalm 15, how do you get to the hill of the Lord? Clean hands, clean heart. So James is delving into their whole tradition of their understanding of God. Mm -hmm. Right there. And the pure pure heart and uh, the single-mindedness, you know, again, it, it, it shows there's a connection here between our image of God and how we're able to respond in these difficult situations. Again, you know, that original temptation in, in Genesis was, was not originally first to disobey God, but was to doubt God's goodness, right? Mm-hmm. You know, to doubt that God really does, that in the end, his will will be done and it will be good for us. The, the first temptation was to have a double-mindedness about God. Well, yeah, I, I do love God. I want to obey and cooperate, but I have to also look out for myself. You know, in a difficult situation, I have to try to worry about where this plan is going, that double-mindedness, um, and it can't stand. You're either going to be in greater submission and belief, faith and hope and love in a good God who loves us, or if we give into that double-mindedness, we begin to doubt more and more and more and take 
reality more into our own hands. And then we find that I, I don't have the smarts for this. I don't have the strength to resist the devil. I don't have the power for my will to be done. Even if, and even if I would, it wouldn't be a good plan. You know, the, you know, it's the sing, the single mindedness of saying, no, I, even when it's difficult, I want to, I, w- I want God's will to be done first. I want that to remain my prayer. Yeah, the the next verse in uh, in James is one of the. I've just looked up quickly to see whether my my study Bible referenced that he was quoting some psalm or something, but doesn't say that. So what does he mean by "be wretched and mourn and weep"? Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to dejection. I, I, I'm soon he was quoting something, uh, mm-hmm. pulling it in there, but you know, I think he, what is he? He's talking about in in being hu- humility, sometimes being cutting through our presumptions. We can be oblivious, mm-hmm. and and like the frog in the pot idea, we can be caught up into our culture. We're just going great, yeah, and, and not realize we're being drawn along on, on a lie, right. And the things that we're, that we're coveting and the things that we're hoarding and the things that we're considering of great value, the things that we're laughing about and are of no value. And so we have to cut through those. And, and so, again, people have misunderstood these to, to be, you know, the ultimate, like, like Monty Python's monks hitting themselves in the head with <laughs> boards. You know, that's... Right. You know, that no, it, this is cutting through this and being humble, as he says, humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. It's not these yeah. things that exalt you. Mm-hmm. It'll be God. Yeah, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of subtlety there that we have to work through in our spiritual life. This is one of the reasons the church gives us feasts and fasts. And when everything is going OK, it's very easy for me to believe about myself. I'm, I'm a pretty virtuous person. I've got a pretty pure heart. I'm pretty detached from the things of this world. You know, like if push came to shove, I'd be able to give stuff up. But you don't want to find out too late that that's not the case. You know, you don't want to, <laughs> um, you find out after you become married or after you ha- have your kids that, oh, I'm not actually a very patient person. I actually do have a temper. I actually really want my own way and get really peeved when I don't get it. And so, you know, to to voluntarily, it's a good strategy voluntarily to say, you know what, it's Lent. I'm going to voluntarily give up chocolate and see how detached I really am. And, and we quickly find out even the smallest things when it becomes a matter. It, and also one thing that's important about the fast too is, is we're, we're doing something in obedience to the church. Fasts are, are kind of tricky things because if we just put them on ourselves, the question is, am I doing this because I want to or I feel really motivated right now or because this is what I'm supposed to do? You know, and again, we have these strategies within the spiritual life to voluntarily say, you know what, for a time, we're going to have a time of, of penance, you know, this Friday or this Lenten season, I'm going to voluntarily be wretched and mourn. I'm going to maybe reflect on my spiritual life. I'm going to dig deeper and ask more tough questions of myself. Am I really detached? Am I really humble? Do, do I really love my neighbor? What things am I like? We, we dig into that and we avail ourselves, Lord, speak to me, show me my sins, show me the ways, um, precisely so that when it's time to feast, when it's Easter, we receive those blessings from God. We receive God's joy and we know, and we're receiving it more purely from him rather than something of our own making and desiring. The interesting context of, of uh, the Lord's prayer in this is that when he does talk about, fa- when our Lord talks about fasting, he's saying, yeah. uh, but don't make a, a public display of it. Right. Right. Don't let everybody know that you're wretched and mourn and weep and, you know, that's not what it's yeah. about. You, you, you clean yourself up. That's because it's between you and the Father. Yeah. It's between you and this is about being you and the Father. This is not about you and yeah. the public. Yeah. And yeah. it's interesting. I'm going to turn to Hebrews 10 passage. I'll keep an eye on the time here. But it's almost as if uh, the writers of Hebrews heard that phrase and he said, well, how do we define this thing? And so the, he, in Hebrews 10, verse 31, he says, hey, guys, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah. I mean, do you take do you take God seriously? Mm. I mean, John Mark, you're even more of a C.S. Lewis 
aficionado for me, but how does he describe Aslan? Uh, oh, he's uh, he's not a tame lion, <laughs> not in the least. That's the point. Yeah, of his trying to. I do- wish I could. I wish I had his quote on him. He's got a great quote on this about uh, you know the people who play at religion. You know, they play at religion. They 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 talk about it, think about it, because it's something in their control. But then they get a touch. You know, and I'm butchering, paraphrasing here, but they they get a touch of the real thing, and they say, wait. What if you were real? What if there really is a pull at the end of that line? You know, what if that would be something entirely, altogether entirely? It's it's like the the, the scripture, the New Testament scripture. Um, you'll know the reference. But uh, those who hold the form of religion, but deny the power of it. Yeah. Sometimes we we glom on to those parts of of the religion of our faith that are comfortable to us, that don't challenge us. But we're not really open to those parts where God might really show up and challenge us to to yeah. live and to think very differently. Yeah, that's Second Timothy 3. When, when Paul's describing the age that we live in, what's it going to be like? And he, it's as if he was watching the news today and this idea of people having a form of religion but denying the reality, mm-hmm. the power of it. Hebrews goes on, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of Aslan, of the living God. Yeah. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, in other words, baptism, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on the prisoners, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of their property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. In other words, because you know what the will of God is. You know what the end is. Yeah. Through the midst of suffering, he goes on, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so you may do the will of God and receive what is promised. In the midst of all these voices, he's saying, don't give up. Mm. Don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away what your enlightenment, your baptism meant. Mm -hmm. You were a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You're a child of God. You're part of the family, the body of Christ. In the midst of all these struggles, don't lose that confidence because at the end of it, there's a great reward. For you have need of endurance, yeah. the will of God in you, so that you may do the will of God and receive what is promised. You know, there, there's an important thing here in this passage and in the Beatitudes and in so many other parts of Scripture that we we may accept theoretically that we are to endure and that we're to persevere through struggle. But sometimes we don't let it enter into our, our actual expectations about our lives. Like we accept it theoretically. Oh, this happens to people. And if it were to happen to me, then I'll try to endure. No, no, it's going to. We don't know what form it will take. You know, it may, it, we, we don't know what it's going to be in our lives, whether it's disease or turmoil or persecution, whatever. Or maybe it's just difficult decisions, just temptations to compromise. I, I was remarking a while back to a friend of mine who's getting into politics about how Christian politicians don't seem to be expecting that moment when they're asked to compromise, either when the choice is between being a successful politician and being true to your faith. In other words, fa- um, succeeding in the eyes of the world or failing in the eyes of the world, but, but, but being true to your heavenly father. Why are we caught off guard by that? you will encounter that decision in your life, perhaps every day, if you're really, really aware from it, if you're really looking for it. You know, this isn't, this isn't a theoretical if, this is a when. Yeah. You know, and that's why, that's why to voluntarily you know, be, being fasting and preparing because it, it's not a question of if, it's when. And so when it happens, we want to be ready to say, Lord, this, this is it. I knew this was going to happen. I will remain faithful here. Um, I'm bringing up a scripture that, it comes back many, many times. It goes right, just with what you're saying, Sirach 2 2. Excuse me, Sirach 2 1. Everybody, you need to memorize this because you have no excuse. Sirach 2 1. My son, if you come forward to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for temptation. Yeah. Sirach 2 1. No excuse. You know it's coming. And that's what we've been reading about. And you want the will to be done through you because you know God's will is good. 
and you want it to be done with all the voices that are going to be there, all the discouragements, because you know. But again, Cyprian says, so if his will is to be done in us, we need have we have need of his will, that is, his help and protection, which is why our Lord called us to pray this prayer. I just want to close with one quick, short little scripture again as we close. Mark 3, 35. Jesus had been preaching, and someone said, Hey, your mother's outside, your brothers, your family. And Jesus makes this amazing statement to the crowd. He says, Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. He's not rejecting his blessed mother. He's just calling us to remember that to be his brother and sister and mother means being humbly obedient yeah. to his father. Yeah. yeah in, in Christ, we have all these mysteries within mysteries that the scripture presents us with us. We have them embodied in Christ. You know, what, what a great gift of God. You know, God could have revealed himself to us in so many different ways, but he reveals himself by becoming man and by living out this mystery of God's God's grace and our free will. We, we, we have that played out in Christ's life. He has total perfect confidence in the Father, and yet he obeys and perseveres to the point of shedding his blood, to the point of giving his life. We see that in him, that interplay between um, praying that God's will be done, working it out, relying on God for strength, calling upon, we, we see that, that, that lived out in his life. And of course, in every saint, that's what we see too, instantiated in a new masterpiece. We have God playing that out again in somebody's life, this interplay of God's grace and our free will. Um, and so that's what, we're, that's what we're called to do. We're called to do the will of God in imitation of Christ so that we too can be a brother and sister uh, and, of him. And remembering that those other Christians out there, even the ones we disagree with, are our brothers and sisters. Our mothers God and fathers. Grant me the grace to uh, to love those who sin differently than I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. I don't go. remember who said that. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, let's pause there, John Mark. We'll everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll pick up next week with the next paragraph in this uh, reading from Cyprian's uh, treatise on the Lord's Prayer. Again, if you go to our website chnetwork.org, you'll be able to get connected with that um, yeah. and uh, and other resources that we have. All right. Thanks, John Mark for joining Thanks, me Dad. on this program. It's always a great pleasure. And thank you for joining us on Deep in Scripture. God bless. We'll be with you again next week. Deep in Scripture is a production of the Coming Home Network International. To hear more episodes, view our full archive of written and video conversion stories, participate in our online community forum, and more, visit chnetwork.org. You're also invited to explore free membership in the Coming Home Network and receive support on your own Catholic journey. Again, visit chnetwork.org for more information.